Pastor Julius Subi, it's wonderful to see you. Please wave to us. Julius is a, a wonderful friend. A co-worker. A man who has carried the DNA of WTM and taken it to the nations of the world. I know he started to minister this morning in the workshop. But tomorrow afternoon he's going to be here ministering to all of us. We love you, Julius. Julius. Welcome. Hallelujah. I have a book here. I've been talking to you in many different angles about the times we are living in. And about the end. This is a book called The Midnight Call. Um, you remember the story of the ten virgins. In the mean, in, at midnight there was a call. Wake up the bridegroom is due. And this is basically what the, this book carries. There's a summary at the back which I just want to read to you. It says the book examines how the one world system has been set up to counter the systems of God's kingdom mm. and to break the Judeo-Christian foundation upon which most of the developed world had built their societies. See how the principle of a set-apart life has been hijacked by the kingdom of darkness and used to build a diabolical world system for this, that kingdom. If the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? This scripture resounds throughout the book. In the midst of growing darkness, is there a strategy to counter the world system and the spirit of the world which directs the affairs of mankind living under its influences? So you can tell what this book is addressing. Amen. It's available at the back. We are just launching it here. It's just coming off the printer. The printers. And it's at the back at only 15,000. But I want to give one to a lucky person here. Okay, okay, okay. Amen. I want to give this to someone. Now, this is not fair. These are two Ugandans who don't live in Uganda. This one lives in America, the other lives in Germany. <laughs> I want to give this to someone who is not from Uganda. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yesterday, or in the last few days, I was talking to you about the, the, our theme verse you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I emphasize something. It's very, very important for us to move in the gifts of the Spirit as well as in the miraculous signs and wonders to see God work miraculously. But to many people, that is all they think about when they consider God's, the Holy Spirit's power. But I reminded you that uh, the apostles were already working miracles before Jesus died. They were casting out demons. They were healing the sick. They were even raising the dead. So it's not just like they had never seen that. But the power of the Holy Spirit raises us above the dictates of the world and makes us be victorious and overcomers. I want to give you an example here. 
In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, it gives us the story of how Jesus was arrested by the Jews. And uh, they came with all weapons and all kinds of things in full force to arrest him. You remember how Peter took out a sword and tried to fight. And Jesus stopped him. But I want to read one verse here. It's verse 56. Let me read 55 to give you context. In the hour, in that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Ndingo mu menyi wa mateko wakabye nnyono kujja ne mujjo ku nkwatanga mbagali de bitala ne migo naberanga na mwe nga njigiriza muye kalu guli runako ne mutankwata ne ekino kibaddewo okutukiriza bigambo byaba nabbi abiri mbya wandikibwa Now listen to the very next line It says Dogamba then all the disciples forsook him or and abai. fled All the disciples forsook him and fled. That word forsook is the same as saying they abandoned him. They deserted him. They forsook him. It's not just running away for your safety or something. It's a decision. I will not go along with this. I cannot manage this anymore. You let go. These miracle working men who had seen his power in their lives and ministry reached a point where they had to make a choice between themselves and him. And they loved themselves much more than they loved him. Remember what we shared yesterday? We said corrupt wisdom. Then self, the self life. And three, that thing. Now, if you were to look at this man, I want you to see how those three things were working in them. Take for example, Peter. Peter. He ran away. But deep inside was saying, but I cannot just run like that. Let me go. He was not going to fight for Jesus. Because he, if he was, he would have stood for him. He wanted just to see what would happen to him. And so he sneaked in the house where Jesus was being held. But when they said, Oh, are, are you not one of them? He said, no, 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 no. no, no. You, you are mistaken. Another one came and said, but you sound like a Galilean, just like him. He said, I don't know him. He denied him. The third time, they came around and said, uh, uh, you must be one of them. And he, he even cursed them that they were yoking him up with Jesus. Do you see the three things? Can you see how his mind, corrupt mind is working? He, he must feel justified in his reasoning, in his arguments. Remember, 
the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and arguments or reasonings and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Do you see the, the arguments, the reasonings, and even things which are taking higher priority from the knowledge of God. The thoughts corrupt wisdom. Second, self love. Self preservation. Self centeredness. When it comes to a real choice, we choose ourselves. And then, of course, that thing. There is always a landing spot in, in all, all of us. That's why the Bible says, do not give the devil a foothold. Because once you give him a foothold, he will take you. Now, I want, to, I want us to see a difference. When those, the, all of that happened before these men received the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. How did their lives change after that? I said the, the power of the Spirit is not just in the miracles we see outside, but in the inner building, the inner strength, the inner ability. You remember what the Bible says? It is He who works within us to will and to do his good pleasure. When the Spirit of God is fully given access to our lives, He works within us even to make us desire what God desires. To be ready and willing to pay any price. Let me read for you how these men ended their lives. All the apostles, how they ended their lives. The first one I want to talk about is Matthew. Matthew was killed in Ethiopia and he was killed by a sword. He was pierced by a sword. Mark. Marco. Mark died in Alexandria in yep. Egypt. Alexandria, Misiri. They dragged him Bamuwarula. with a horse through the streets until he was dead. Luke. Luke. Luke was hanged in Greece. That's how he died. John. Yokana. John was deep fried in boiling oil during the wave of persecution that was in Rome. But he did not die. And afterwards they sentenced him to be imprisoned in the mines on the island of Patmos where he spent a long, long time. But he did not die. He was later freed and he returned to Turkey and became the bishop of Edessa. He died as an old man. He is the only apostle who died naturally. Peter Peter. Peter was crucified upside down on an X-shaped cross. Peter. James the just was thrown over a hundred feet down from the southeast pinnacle of the temple. But he did not die. And when they discovered that he had survived the fall, they beat him with a club on, until he died. James the Greater, the son of Zebedee, 
He was beheaded in Jerusalem. Bartholomew. Bartholomew. Who we see in the beginning of the Gospel of John called Nathaniel. He was flayed to death by a whip. Andrew Nerea was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Patras in Greece. The apostle Thomas, Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India. Jude, the brother of Jesus, Jude, was killed with arrows. Matthias, Ma, 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 Matthias. The, the apostle chosen to replace Judas Iscariot. Matia, yadda, he was stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas. Barunabba. He was stoned to death at Salonika. Paul. Paulo. He was tortured and then beheaded by Emperor Nero. Now, to put this in perspective, I want you to remember the words of Jesus Christ. As he was preparing these men for their ministry. These are the things he told them in Luke chapter 21 verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for a witness. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I'll give mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by your parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they'll put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. Now, brother, sister, I, I can feel. Your spirit is very, very, very quiet. In other words, you are saying, am I signing up for that kind of thing? <laughs> is that what it means to serve Jesus? Humanly, nobody can do this. Nobody can do this. That's why he said, don't go out before the gift from above comes upon you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Amen. Amen. So, beloved, I pray that your heart will yearn for the deeper life. Because According to the measure of faith you exercise, that's what you will get. If you are satisfied with just speaking in tongues, you will never open up your heart to the deeper experience. If you are satisfied with just praying and maybe one miracle happens or demon flees. Let me remind you. 
The apostles went out to preach when Jesus sent them. And they cast out demons. And they did wonders. And they came back to Jesus. And said, Master, even the demons obeyed us. They fled when we cast them out. And Jesus said, that's okay. I saw Satan falling yes, no, from heaven. I saw it happening. But listen. Let that not be your pleasure. Don't let that be the meaning. It, rejoice that your names are written in the book of the Father. If you're clapping, clap for God. So it's not so much the miracles, the demons going. The, it's wonderful. That's wonderful. But for us to be overcomers and to be able to finish our journey ready to stand before the Father. There are some things God will never entrust us with. Because he knows we cannot stand. Amen. Amen. So today, Warero, this afternoon, I have it on my heart to share with you what can we do to accommodate that deeper power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to share a number of things with you. And I'm trying to build a context from which I'm bringing this to you. Because I know most people do not want to change their lives. Amen. 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 Let's go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. It was a Sunday. It was a Sunday. That night, I had a dream. And somebody I did not know, but I'd never seen, but I accepted, just accepted him as Lord. He came and said to me, I want you to abandon all your ambitions and everything that you have been planning to become in life. For I have a plan for your life. You are going to preach my word. I will take you to the nations of the world. And you will turn many people back to me. This is your life. Embrace it. Accept it. And prepare for it. When I woke up, I remember I went to my sister and told her everything I had got. And I received it. I began to accept that I'm not going to be a businessman. I'm not going to be all, all these things I had been planning. But I'm going to be a preacher, an evangelist. And I joined another long story I won't go into. The Lord joined me up with his servant, Apostle Deo. And I used to admire this man. I admired the way he prayed. The way he preached. Everything about him. And Apostle Deo had a, a, a peculiar calling. God had taught him how to read the Islamic Quran. It, it happened to him in a dream. An angel appeared to him. You know, he had a calling to evangelize Muslims. And he argued with them all 
everywhere he went. But he had one disadvantage. They could read the Bible, but he could not read the Quran. And so they would say some things which he doesn't know whether it's true or not. And he used to pray and say, Lord, give me some way to overcome them. One day he was in Masaka. That's a town in South Southern Uganda. And he had a dream. Someone woke him up and opened a scroll and said, Read. But it was in Arabic. And he said, I don't know how to read Arabic. And the angel said, By faith, read. Just open your mouth and speak what comes to your lips. And he started to speak. And he read the whole scroll. And the angel put it aside and brought another scroll. And when he was reading the second scroll, he could understand what he was reading. After the second, they gave him a third. The next day, he went and bought a Quran. Opened it. And he could read it. That is the God we serve. So, Apostle Deo had that charisma around him. And he was a man of the gospel. He's the man who taught me how to pray. He taught me how to fast. Amen. Amen. And we used to go with him in the city to do crusades. We would stand around him and he would be on the platform and preach and we were there to cheer him on. But yeah, as much as I loved and enjoyed working with him, I was a bit uncomfortable because I knew God has called me to preach the gospel of evangelism. But I did not feel that special attachment to the Muslim cause. I did not feel like the, I want to spend the rest of my life just focusing on that particular niche. So I remember one day I prayed. I said, Lord, you are the God of Apostle Deo. And you are my God. You have entrusted him with a great calling and a very special assignment. Could you have an assignment for me too? Is there something that I can say God told me to go and do this. Something I can die for. Something I can give up everything in the world for. But he didn't answer me. Yet, a few weeks later, I went on evangelism with uh, Pastor Stephen Sebiala. Those of you know. And we were in Gayaza. And we were going to plant a church. And I had offered, I can stay here and pastor this church for about three months until you bring another pastor to take over. I had a dream. In the middle of the night. And in this dream, I won't go into details. I saw the heavens open. And I saw the Lord come. With angels about him. And he was coming in glorious light. But what really attracted my attention was what was happening on the ground. People were screaming with fear. People were running away. Their eyes wide open with fear. You could see that they were terrified. Not only non-believers. Even believers. I remember I stayed stuck where I was. My 
feet couldn't move. And I looked up at him. And as he was coming, I could see his face. And he was crying. And he began to sing a song in the middle of his tears. I can still remember that song. And he was singing saying, Where are they that I paid a price for? Where are they that I died for? Where are they for whom I gave so much? And where are they? Even those who are called by my name. They cannot stand in my presence. They are fleeing away. They are asking the mountains to bury them. Because you are not ready. And he was crying. And you could feel the deep, the depth of his pain. At that time, he turned and looked at me where I was standing. And he said, when you preach, tell the people that I'm coming soon and they are not ready. If they don't change, they are going to flee from my coming. Go and preach whether they like it or they don't like it. Whether they receive it or they don't receive it. But tell them the time is very short. And the hour of his return is due. And he gave me this scripture in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 40. Verse 3. Verse 3 to 5. Says the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Edobo zilo ya yogera ayogera liwuli kikanga agama anti muteketeke kubolia mukama mudungu muterezolu gudole mudungu buli chiwonvu kiri gulumirizwa na buli sozi na kasozi ne bikakkanyizibwa no bucha mu buli gololwa ebife bitali bisende ne biterezebwa when i came out of that dream when nawulira when nava mu kiroto omo my whole body was shaking ombiri gwego nanga gukankana i knew beyond doubt ne manya otali kubusa busa that was not just a normal dream ntekyo kyali kiroto kya bulijjo but it was a very clear message from the lord ne gwali oba ko butelegere ko kuveri mukama and i felt ne mpulira oh eh the god who sent me to preach the gospel has given me a specific line of message. And I immediately adapted that into my evangelism. So everywhere I would stand to preach, I would tell people Jesus is coming soon. Repent. I would tell them the consequences of not being found ready. I would do whatever I knew how to do to convince them. However, there wasn't any change in the response to my preaching. Very, very, very few people were coming to the Lord. And we would spend two, three hours in the evening of every day preaching and you would get three people come, two people come. After some time, I felt frustrated. I said, Lord, you gave me clear direction. And I'm following those directions. I'm preaching what you told me to preach. You told me to preach and bring people to you. That's what I'm doing. And you gave me a specific line of message. And I'm doing that. Why don't I see results? And the Lord said to me, now I hope somebody is listening. He said, the words alone 
will not change the people because they are captives. They are blind and they are hardened. They are captive to demonic forces. They have been blinded, spiritually blinded. And they are hardened. Now, each of these things is a principle of life, but I'm not the purpose of my sharing today is not to teach on that. And he said to me, if you want to see fruit in your life, you've got to determine to become an intercessor for the people. To stand in the gap for the people. Carry them as if they are your own children. Carry their sins as if they are your sins. Plead and cry as if you are the one in, in danger of destruction. I will go on to the next. Then he said, but is that not all? If you pray, he said, when you are praying for the people, don't say to God, have mercy on them. Help them, Lord. Forgive them. Say, you have to identify with them. Take the, your position among them. And say, Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us. And cry to the Lord. Like you really believe if he does not forgive, you are damned. And said, when you break through to the place of grace and mercy, this is what will happen. The Lord will begin to reveal to you what is binding the people. You will see what is holding them in spiritual blindness. You will see what is hardening their hearts. You will see the lusts and drives that are driving them on. And once you get to that place, after you've broken into that special place of mercy and grace, you have the Lord on your side. You are no longer an enemy coming from the other side asking for forgiveness. Now you can act on behalf of God. And that's where spiritual warfare begins. He shows you how to deal with the powers of darkness. Not all demons or spirits are fought the same way. He will show you how to attack and contend. Now, when I heard all these things, I was so excited. I said, now I know what to do. Not only am I going to pray to, to preach to the people, I'm going to intercede for them. But not only that, I'm going to be doing deliverance ministry. Everywhere we go to preach, we will call people to come forward and we shall pray for deliverance. We shall cast out the demons. To my understanding, that was what God was asking for. I had been in ministries where we were casting out demons. With the Apostle Deo, with the Pastor Robert Kayanja, Kayanja, even with Pastor Stephen Sebiala. It was not something that was intimidating. So I was rejoicing inside that I know what to do. Then the Holy Spirit said to me, that's not enough. 
Deliverance deals with bondage on an individual level. You can cast out a demon. I don't know how much I should go into this. Because it's a wide subject. I want to zero down and reach something. He showed me the scripture in the book of Luke where he himself was teaching and he said when a demon is cast out it wanders around in dry places trying to find rest but finds none. And it says I will go back to my house. So when it comes, it finds that the house is clean, well ordered. But you remember, before that he had said, if a strong man keeps his house, everything in it is safe. Nobody can take anything out. But if a stronger than he comes and Binds him up. Puts him on the side. Takes away his armor. He can take all things out of his. Do you know what that picture means? Let's say. If I am the victim. I am under captivity. In other words. There is a strong man holding me captive. I am helpless. I can't do anything. But if the spirit of God comes, he is stronger than the demon. He is stronger than this dark power. He can bind it. Throw it aside. And set me free. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, when the demon leaves, it wanders around and finding no rest, it comes says, I'll go back to my house. And when it comes, it's first spies. The house is clean. The house is orderly. But do you notice the scripture does not mention anybody inside there. Where is the stronger than him? It is God's desire that within our lives he said you will receive the spirit. He will be in you and he will be with you. Some of us are just so contented to have the anointing upon our lives. But we do not think about building the anointing inside our lives. The house is clean. The house is orderly. But who is there? Say with me. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There is a deposit that is supposed to be inside that when the enemy comes oh oh he sees the one stronger than him already there. Will he go and bring seven other spirits to come and enter? No. Uh -huh. If he finds a deposit there, in our WTM language, we call it a fountain. If he finds a fountain, a living fountain there, of the power of the Holy Spirit, he's not going to bother coming in because he remembers the experience of being cast out. But if he finds nobody, he goes to seek 
reinforcement. Bible says he seeks seven other spirits more wicked than he is. Now, are you with me? There are things the Lord began to teach us at that time. That was 1987. And I'm writing a book because suddenly I realized I had neglected a lot of those principles. So as we've been praying to go back to the foundations, the Lord has been bringing back these things. And I thought they are so precious I would like to write them into a book and be able to pass it on to other people. Now, let us come back to the demon. This is what we learned. Okay, I'll be brief on this. The devil operates at three levels. The first level is the individual. In the individual, he can bind the mind. Even when with non-believers, he can bind the spirit. Can blind spiritually blind him. Can torment the body. Can touch his relationships. Can touch his finances. Everything that is individual. And many times when we are dealing with deliverance we deal with the individual level. But the second level where the enemy operates is what we call the social level of darkness. In other words, how you fit into the people with whom among whom you live. And how do they influence you? And here we look at five very, very distinct areas. The first one is religion. Where you worship will affect who you are. Because it affects what you believe. It affects the mannerisms that you think are proper. And whatever. The culture of what we believe religiously will shape who we are. And if there are any loopholes where demons operate from within your religious system, those demons will have a legal ground upon you. The second area is family. family. As you know, there are many challenges and trappings in the family. In marriage, in parenting, in the home environment, if the enemy has got access into the family, either against the marriage, against the Maybe with immorality and infidelity. Or with children. Whether it's abuse. Or exposure to negative influence. All these are open doors for demonic penetration. When a child or a person is growing up in that family. It will feel normal. That life that they are experiencing will be their normal. But yet, 
to God, that's not normal. But if it is normal to him, I want you to think, how does it affect his wisdom? You remember corrupt wisdom? How does it affect the way he thinks? The way he sees life? What he calls right? What he calls wrong? What he calls justifiable? All those attitudes and those are his, not by choice, but by association. Amen. Amen. The same thing happens in the workplace. And whatever is happening to us through government, then things which happen to us through our education, through media, through entertainment, through culture. What I'm trying to show you here, remember those three things. Corrupt wisdom. Second is self. Now, what, when a child grows up in an abusive environment, how are they going to be in terms of self, self-centeredness? They f- have a feeling the world is a cruel place. I have to fight for myself. I don't care what I do to others in the course of fighting for my life. If a child grows up in a sexually exposed environment, what is his mind going to be? His thought process. If it starts to exercise self-centeredness, self-love, self-gratification, do you see the open doors already in his life? Now, this is not just individual bondage. This is social bondage. If this man comes to church or to the crusade and there is deliverance, effective deliverance, and they cast out the demons inside of him, Afterwards, where does he go? Back to the environment which is infested with darkness. Back to that lifestyle that is called normal in his family. That is called normal in his workplace. Are you with me? Do you see that it is possible for someone to be delivered and yet not change. It becomes very easy for the demon to come back. Because it, the environment is conducive for that demon to come back. If you take a good piece of uh, let me say bread. Fresh bread. And you put it at the rubbish dump. Do you expect flies to come upon it? Yes. Why? The environment. Even when you cast them away, they are going to go and come back. And you cast them away, they are going to go around and come back. If you take that same bread away from the rubbish dump, take it to your house, put it on the on the dining table. You may look for those flies and not find them. Tell your neighbor environment. 
Are you with me? Tukua tagana. Now, the Lord did not stop there. Then he showed us that these forces they don't just control the individual or his family members. But they connect with other families that are in such an a condition. I, I, I hope somebody can picture this. Can you see a spider web? The spider web does not stop in one spot. It connects with the next level. The, the next level. The next level. And you can see those circular lines. That's the same thing that happens in the spirit. These forces operating in one family will connect with forces in another family that is in similar condition. Then to another family. Then to another family. Until it's like a net. But then there are also forces operating in the workplace. And all the people that are sub submitting to those forces they connect with others then with others then with others and they form a net then in the religious system the same thing happens in the governmental environment in the social values do you see the web and Imagine, have you ever seen a spider capture a fly? Anybody ever seen that? The fly has got wings. He can fly away. But when the spider skims well, and the moment he begins to wind up the, that fly. You look at the fly struggling. Suddenly, the wings are no longer useful. Eventually you see it being squeezed. And you think this insect is able to fly away. But this other insect which is so small with tiny legs cannot even fly. But it can take this fly captive and hold it into captivity. I remember one time I was watching and the spider was skimming until the fly came and fell on the web. And the spider moved fast and was just winding and winding and winding. And then it ran away. And it waited. And the fly struggled. And struggled. Until eventually it became quiet. That, that's how most of us are. We are caught in a web. We fight. We struggle. Eventually we say, okay. I will just survive here. And we become part of the system. Our minds think like the system. Our self natures are shaped by the system. Are you with me? Don't worry if you don't understand everything. I'm pushing to go to where I want to take you. But all of this is now you can see this system. It can be covering families all over the city of Kampala. All over the workplaces in Kampala. They are all connected. Then the, Lord, the Lord revealed to us that there is a third level of the enemy working that is in the heavenly. These are what they call principalities and powers. They rule by remote control. Up from up in the heavenly places, they control the social darkness. The web, the web. 
web. They control that web. And through the web, they control the individuals. And the Lord was, when the Lord was showing us all of this, I said, wow. Eh? Where do we start? And how can we fight all the forces in people's homes and their places? How can we do that? And how, how can we touch those powers above them? And the Lord said to me, You cannot. You cannot. Because you don't have the spiritual fountain necessary equal to that challenge. If you were to engage in warfare against those powers, two things will happen. Either the demons will ignore you. <laughs> they can ignore you and not even they don't even shake. You don't even see any sign. Or they will hit back at you. Jesus I know. And Paul I know. Who are you? The Lord said to me. Yes, you don't have the spiritual authority. Now everybody thinks whoever has believed in Jesus can command every demon to go. That's not true. Even in the Bible, we see the apostles could not cast out some demons. You hear people say, I bind every spirit of a Kampala. You. <laughs> You. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, I think I've made my point. The point is the level of authority at which you will operate depends on the depth of the fountain you have built inside of you. When you build a deep fountain, the level of authority in which you are operating is high. Sometimes, Rusi, you simply walk into an institution or a, a, a territory. And the demons begin to scream. Remember in the Bible? Jesus was just walking. And the demons saw him. Said, whoa! What do you want with us? You holy one of God. We know who you are. Have you come to judge us before the day? What did he say? He had just said nothing to them. But they saw and recognized authority. When he went to the city of Gadaren, a man who had defied everybody, he was full of demons, thousands of demons. And they had tried to bind him. He would break the shackles. He lived in the graveyards. When Jesus landed on the shore, the demons felt the authority. And the man came running and said, do not cast us away. Have you come to destroy us? They knew who he was. This is not just Jesus alone. Anybody operating in the spirit can grow their spiritual authority. And Jesus simply looked and said, Who are you? Yes, are you? We are legion. Because we are very many. Please don't just send us to those 
to those pigs there. Before he cast them out, they were asking to be cast out. Cast us there, cast us, we shall go, we shall go. And what did Jesus say? Go. And they went. And they went. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was mentioning to some intercessors here. Sister Nuri, you can testify of this for me. You are, you are in the islands. <laughs> this happened so many, many times. Actually, on their island, Sister Nuru's island, oh, called no. Lubia. We went there. And we spent three weeks with them. Nabo. Day and night, we were together in the word and in prayer. And by the time we left, that church had changed. Their prayer, their power, their worship. And we had told them about dealing with the forces that are in the area. We went with them up into the mountains. And prayed in some of the caves. But we didn't finish them all. And we told them, you've got to continue and finish this. The time came as they were continuing this mission. Demons would come upon the people of the village and they would be act like mad people. And they were saying send away the, the balokole. Send away these born agains. They have disturbed the whole village. They are, they are chasing us away. Where will you get the money now? And you know the fishermen used to take offerings to those, to those ro uh, rocks to give their gods. Now their gods are saying these born agains are chasing us away. Chase them away. Otherwise we are not going to bless you. The whole village went into confusion. And the ROC, the chief, chief called a meeting. <laughs> now, you may say this, the, the, the group, the team from Kampala had the authority. Uh -uh. Uh -huh. This church, and by the way, we found that church in a very terrible state. <laughs> there were three churches on that island. And all of them were <laughs> like cults. They were all, one was following uh, a prophet who calls himself Noah. I mean, they were all heretic. They were all heretic. But God gave us grace. We loved them. We drew them closer. We, sh we shared the word of God with them. And they began to repent of the waywardness they had been going. And they literally started a, 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 a new congregation. Where's Pastor Kakairi? He's not here. Pastor Kakairi became their first pastor. Now, they combined congregation. So these, these were very, very young immature Christians. But they took the disciplines that were taught to them seriously. And that's, those are the disciplines I want to end with today. It, is, it doesn't take how long you have been in salvation. No, that's not what is important. It's how you build your inner man. These were very, very, very young and immature Christians. But when they practiced what was given to them, they were 
searching powers of darkness not only on individual level they were touching the economy of the whole island they were touching the idolatry of the whole island and by the way in that island no you will correct me that island was so sexually immoral that when a fisherman would go to the lake to fish, the wife would go to another man to cook. And she, she is someone's, el someone's else until even when the husband comes back. That was the level of immorality there. They were proud of living like this. There's something I, that puzzled me. I'd never seen it any, anywhere else. The spirit of sexual immorality was so high in this village. There were goats in that village. And they were not tied. They were moving around. But the male goats almost did nothing but want to mate. <laughs> they mated so much that the female goats died because they could not feed they were all oh, they were being oppressed by the males that, i don't know whether you find that normal the female ghost could not find the time to eat because they were always being buttered by the males and it was common to find them dead that is where i saw <laughs> it a male goat trying to mate with another male goat but listen we saw it we say this can only be demonic we prayed and after some time they stopped doing that they stopped doing that amen Amen. So the chief called the, the whole village together. Say, what are we going to do about this Balokoli? And everybody was saying, they go, they, sh they should leave the island, they should leave. These are our gods, our idols, our, our grandees. And almost there was unan unanimous decision too send the church off the island. Then there was an old man who stood up and said, Hey, those born again can make demons cry. Are you humans going to send them away? <laughs> if they can make huh? demons cry, <laughs> Are you going to send them away? If they can make the demons you worship cry, don't you realize they are higher than you? <laughs> Amen. And that was the end of the story. Amen. I have a witness, at least someone to say, yeah. She she was was there. There. We would go on mission from Lubia, Lubia, Lubia Island, Lubia Chizinga Lubia. to go to, let's say, Bugaya Island. And one time, Rumu, as we were going, the first time, soka, the moment we landed at the beach, or beach the shore. Something happened in the village. People were screaming and were saying, Badeo, Bagende, Bagende. Let them go back. Let them go back. They are bringing another power here. The whole village was bazak. 
they all could sense the authority we were coming with. And the, it was not the first time they had been sensing our coming like three days before. And they were going through the village saying when they come, don't receive them. There's a man who had offered us a house where to stay. They told him if, if they come and stay here, we're going to burn that house. Then there was another house. They call it ley lines. They had built it. <laughs> they built it in what they call a ley line. It's a communication line in the spirit between different spiritual points. I know some of my friends here from the West may say, those are African things. I remember I was in London. And after I'd been teaching, a woman said, I really thank God that I live in Britain. There are no demons in Britain. I don't know how I, I could ever live in Africa. <laughs> she, do, she doesn't even know that there are demons <laughs> in Britain. <laughs> so I don't know. If you don't understand, just bear with me. Let's move on a little bit. So they, they had built a house <laughs> in the ley line. <laughs> Those who understand the spiritual realm, you cannot live in that house. It would be called a haunted house. So the house was there. Nobody could stay in it. And that is the house they took us to. They took us and said, that's the house we are giving you. And for us, we did not know. We entered. It was a small house. And we had a big, a big team. So we, we couldn't all fit inside. So we said, let the Women sleep inside. The men shall sleep outside. By the way, those things were normal. So we slept outside. In the evening, one man came and said, my children, please don't stay in this house. <laughs> If you stay in this house by tomorrow morning, you'll be you have a dead body here. And we said, Tell us what do you know about this house? <laughs> and he told us this, 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 this happened, this happened. He said, Okay. They, we are going to work on it. And that night, we spent the night in prayer. Spent the whole night in prayer. In the morning, those people who gave us the house, they came, hey, are you okay? Is everything alright? And everything was alright with us. <laughs> Some sisters took containers to go to the well. And when they go to the well, there were two women there. And they were bent over like they were washing. So the, the sisters could only see them from the back. And they were talking to each other. Where did these people come from? What kind of power is it they have? We must kill them. We must stop them. And the sisters 
They wanted to listen. But as they were listening to these two women speaking, one woman straightened up. Do you know what? She had no head. It was not a human being. It was just a body without a head. And when she turned around, she said, hey! And the other one also stood up no, and there was no head. And they disappeared. <laughs> so, the sisters drew water and they came back. Actually, the stories of that island and eh, many other islands eh, they just demonstrate one thing. Greater is he who is within us than he who is in the world. The Lord was teaching us that if we will build our spiritual fountains, we shall have the authority not only to do deliverance on an individual, but to penetrate into the social systems as well as into the principalities in the heavens. Now, how do we build that? Fountain. How do you build that fountain? And that's what I would like to leave with you. Because if there's anything you can take out of this conference, this is what I would like you to take away. As a practical takeaway that you will have the rest of your life. Even if you don't see us again, if you will give yourself to these principles, you will live to testify of the goodness of the Lord. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, it says, Gamba. Verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor grows weary. Tonna manya. Tonna wulida. Mukama ye katonda tali guawo. Omutonzu wen komerero yensi. Tazirika sota kowa. Elana magazigete wali no mainza kugapima. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Awa manya abazirika no ya talina buinza mwongela kamanyi. Abafubu kabali zirika bali ko wanabali nzibali gwira dala. Na yaba abali indirina mukama bali damu bujama nyigabwe. Bali tumbira nebi wa watu ronge mpungu. Bali duki rambiro. Bali duka ambiro. Nebata kowa. Bali tambula na ye. Tebali zirika. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now. When we talk about waiting upon the Lord. Most people think maybe you are talking about fasting. But. But. We can build a lifestyle of seeking after God, abiding with God, and waiting upon Him. And we call that lifestyle a lifestyle of a prayer altar. 
A lifestyle of a prayer altar. God willing, tomorrow we shall have a book here about prayer altars. Amen. So, we can't teach everything there is to teach about altars. But, you'll find a lot in that book. But of, as, as of now, let me give you what the foundation of an altar. Here in Uganda, Uganda, so many people have been practicing prayer altars for a long time. But some people have lost the gist of what an altar really is. To some people, a prayer altar is a prayer time. A prayer group. A prayer session. And without using too many words, I want to say, they are not the same. The fact that you are holding a, a time of prayer does not necessarily mean that you have a prayer altar. A prayer altar has got distinctives. And the first one and the most important one is the purpose of coming to the altar is not so much to tell God about our needs. Do we tell God about our needs at the altar? Yes, we do. But that's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose of an altar is to draw the presence of God. To draw the presence of God. Do you remember? When a greater than he comes, he binds him. And then he can rob his house, empty his house. So the, the, the Heart of the altar is to draw the greater than he to come to us. And the most important thing anybody should learn at the altar how do we draw the presence? And how do we court the presence once it comes? How do we abide in the presence? And how do we receive guidance and direction from the Lord's presence. If we have prayer times, good prayer times, but we miss these elements of drawing the presence, of abiding in his presence, of hearing from him, then we have missed the altar. We have prayer but not a prayer altar. And I know that there are so many, 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 many so-called altars all around the place. A people who pray but, ne but they never get to hear the Lord. Never get to experience his reality as a presence. That's not his desire. His desire is to abide with us. And for us to come to know him. And anybody can draw the presence of God. Anybody and everybody can draw the presence of God. Anybody and everybody can court and hold and abide in the presence of God. Do you remember when Jesus was resurrected? And he was walking on the road to Emmaus. The two disciples that were, he, were, were walking with him and did not recognize him. They reached where they were going. And the Lord made like he's continuing to walk on. But they constrained him to, to stay. stay. 
They compelled him to stay. Brother, sister, that is something you can do. When we are in the presence of God, and I know that there are people here who, who have had this experience, you come into the presence, and maybe after the gathering, you leave the presence. You don't have to. You can constrain the presence to stay with you. Even if you experience the presence here in a gathering, as you go back home, as you go back to rest, you can court that presence. It can stay with you. It can go with you to your bedroom, to your bed. You can experience it. You can wake up in the middle of the night and make connections with it. Amen. Amen. So I hope you really get it in your spirit. When we talk of a prayer altar, we are not just talking about prayer. We are talking about encounter. Do you remember in the temple? Would the priest, the high priest, Fulfill his role when he goes in and the presence does not come down. Would he be considered as uh, having fulfilled his role? You go into the Holy of Holies and the presence does not come down. And you think you have represented Israel in the presence of God? And these were shadows. Of the reality. We are now living in the reality. The presence should not be a myth. Now. There are certain things. That act as principles of his presence. When we honor them. He honors us. When we dishonor them, he will dishonor us. I'm sure there are people here who have ever known the reality of God's presence. And they have ever been in a, a state where they not only experience God's presence in a gathering like this, but they can also experience it in their rooms when they are all alone. And they have ever done it before and pressed into the presence until they broke through. And they have ever known that as a reality and a lifestyle. But when you break these principles, I'm just going to mention to you. Even if you have ever experienced it, you will lose it. You will lose it. And then you will talk about it as in the past. The experience of the presence. But when you would go alone into the room, you will have no ability to pray until that outpouring comes upon you. I and when we are like that, especially if we are prayer leaders, we come to lead prayer and we can pray all night and the presence doesn't come down. That everybody goes away in the morning feeling that they have invested a good night. But they did not meet with him. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to make you feel hungry. I want you to feel hungry for him. To the point you say, Lord, I want to meet with you. 
I want to experience you and I don't want it to be once at a while. I want to know the joy of coming into your presence. It's biblical, it's of God. The Bible says in Hebrews, come boldly to the throne of grace and receive help when you need it. Boldly. Not timidly. Because it's not by our merit. But by his purchase. He has purchased a way. We have a pass to enter into the presence of God. Now, but these are three important things. There are three things we normally call in WTM. The three foundation stones. Three foundation stones. Because in the very, very early days, <laughs> I remember when the Lord gave me the mandate, go to the, all the nations, prepare my people for my return. I know we had been seeing one, one wonderful things happening. People being healed, people being delivered. But this is what I say to the Lord. God, you have sent so many people to do that. Since 2,000 years ago, people have been preaching that you are coming back. What difference am I going to make? How am I going to be different? Except, Lord, give me the power to work signs and wonders like nobody has. Such that when the people see, they will say, surely, God is with this man. Do you hear that? I was talking like a man. So give me that power to do the unbelievable, the astounding, so that people will believe. And this is what he replied to me. You don't need that. Because even those who saw my miracles, some did not believe. <laughs> so, it who, who can be a greater miracle worker than Jesus Christ? But this is what he said. But I will give you what it will take to get the work done. Amen. Amen. I saw in that moment, I saw like a platform. And then I saw myself step on the platform. And when I stepped on the platform, there came like a hedge made of small wooden uh, placards. And it, it went all around the platform. And I was inside. And the Lord said to me, I'm going to give you three principles. If you stand upon them, they will be your platform. They will be your level of authority. And then that hedge you saw. I'm going to give you seven disciplines. If you practice them, there will be a hedge around you. The enemy will fight you. He will not overcome you. Amen. Amen. So, I'm painting this because that's the way the Lord painted it to me. You want authority? He says, I'm going to give you what to stand upon. The moment you stand on those three, they give you a level of authority. Two, you want protection? I'm going to give you seven disciplines. You practice them in your life. The enemy will never touch you. Even if he does, he will never overcome you. So what are the three principles that we call the three foundation stones of life? 
Enono zine satu. Zezidu waze tuita emisinje emikule jovula mu. Obama inja gomu sinji guovula mu. The first one. Soka. Is based on the scripture. E sinzi la kuchawa ndikibwa. In the second book of Corinthians. Mubakoli inso echo kubidi. Verse 14. Es. Chapter 5, verse 14. Es sura tano orinyiru akumi na nyia. It says, Rugamba, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them, and rose again. Kubango kwa gala kwa katonda kutu waliriza. Ngumu bo yafira bo na bo na cheba vabafa. Yafiri da vantu bo na. Abadam bale mengo kubela abadam kubua abwe boka. Wabula kubuoyo e yabafiri da na zukira. That he died for us. Nti yatu firi da. Which means we are all dead. Kita geza fena tulibafu. And since he died for us. Oruo kuba yatu firi da. And therefore we were all dead, then we can no longer live for ourselves. We can only live for him who died and rose again for us. So our first foundation stone says, my life is not my own. It belongs to he who died and rose again for me. My life Everybody say with me, my life is not my own. Say, my life is not my own. Life is not my own. Amen. Amen. My life is not my own. My life is not my own. It belongs to him. It belongs to him. Who lived and died, who died and rose again for me. Who died and rose again for me. Now, do you realize, brethren, that is an antidote against the self-nature? When your life is no longer your own, it belongs to Jesus, then you are not going to be self-centered, self-promoting, self-seeking, self-gratifying, because it's it's not your life. And if it is his life, then you want to listen to him to know how to live his life. You are going to be led by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. The second one is based on the scripture of the, of, in the book of John. Hallelujah. Amen. It's the book of John chapter 4. Verse 34. It says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Ye uh uh Esura nya or in Yurasa to Munya Rugamba. Yes na badamunti e chokuria change kwe kukore yan to mabiaya gala era no to krizomure mugwe. So our second foundation stone says A jinger of fellow musinja yokuigamba I live for no other reason. Nti sirina song and embezao but to fulfill the purposes of God. Wabula ktu kriza began rabia katonda. Everybody say it with me. Chidemu. I live for no other reason. I live for no other reason. Just repeat after me. I live for no other reason. I live for no other reason. But to fulfill the purposes of God. But to fulfill the purposes of God. If you study that principle, it means I am looking for nothing in this world. Anything that I go for, I must go for it because it fulfills God's purposes. You completely change from the set of the environment we just 
described. What, what we were describing, the family, the workplace, the social environment, all that influence will have to be broken off. Amina. Amina. The third one. The third principle we say, I submit to the law of unconditional love for all people. Just as the Lord loved me when I was still an enemy. I submit to the law of unconditional love for all people. Just as the Lord loved me when I was still an enemy. Say it after me. I submit to the law of unconditional love for all people. I submit to the law of unconditional love to all people. I submit to the law of unconditional love for all people. I submit to the law of unconditional love for all people. Just as the Lord loved me when I was still an enemy. Just as the Lord loved me when I was still an enemy. This one, if we really submit ourselves to it, we don't love people because they are good. We don't love people because they are easy. Because that's, God loved us when we were not lovable. He loved us when we were detestable. And we want to learn love from our Father. I will stop here. And maybe next time we, we, felt we meet together, I will talk about the seven essentials. And those seven essentials are the things we do to build up our spiritual fountain. When we, when we practice them and they are all about God. We begin to build our inner, inner strength. We begin to build the capacity to hold his power. And we, be, we begin to the capacity to win. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thought I would be able to finish all of them today, but we will stop here. We will build on it on the, my last session with you. Hallelujah. This evening we have a great man of God joining us. The Lord uses him in a very, very, very uh, profound way. Very prophetic. I encourage you to be prepared for that ministry. And by the way, tomorrow, we are expecting our very dear sister, Heidi Baker, Heidi Baker. to be arriving. And all of these are going to add to the whole theme of our conference. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Amen. Amen. Now, my role in this conference has been more of plowing your, the ground of your heart. You know when the ground is hardened, you can't plant anything there. But my role has been to plow, to plow so that when the rains come, the ground can accommodate. But before we go into prayer, right, I want to ask you take your offering 
And let us give to the Lord. You know, prayer is an interesting thing. When you go through the Bible, you see many times when they were coming to seek after the Lord. They would not only take their prayers, they would take a sacrifice to the Lord. It is a spiritual expression that somehow opens the door for us. At one time the Lord even said through Moses three times all men shall appear before the Lord every year. But don't come to appear before the Lord empty handed. So we may not be able to fully explain it but there is a connection between our giving to the Lord and our pressing into his presence. So I want to encourage you to give like a hungry man, a hungry woman. Saying, Lord, I am so hungry to experience you. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Let's rise up unto our feet.